The response of love. The record of God concerning his great love for us is so marvelous, so overwhelming, it fills our hearts with wonder. Surely, if we are ever to perceive real love, is it at the cross? There he commends the infinite nature of it and proves beyond question its sincerity. But the little man inside of you is hidden so long from God that it's difficult to really believe it was all for him. You've lived so long afraid to even think that someone could love you, let alone God himself. Most of us have been intimidated by the impersonal words of modern evangelism that stresses the love of God for mankind. It is true that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Perhaps these broad terms discourage and defeat you, but listen with your heart as I tell you that the cross was for you alone. The Apostle Paul prayed that you might be able to comprehend the breadth and length and depth and height and to know by deep personal experience the love of Christ for you. He longed that you would be rooted and grounded in this marvelous fact that God loves you and proved it by sending his son to die. Paul himself had a deep personal knowledge of Jesus' love for him. When he spoke of the cross, he said Christ loved him and gave himself for him. He never thought in terms of the world, but when he saw Calvary, he saw only Jesus and himself. The eternal love wherewith God loved you is a self-sacrificial love called out of his great heart due to the preciousness of the object loved. That object was you. It was you who called out of his great heart the love that sent his only begotten Son. It was you who called out of the heart of Jesus in Gethsemane the willingness to take the cup of your sin and sins and drain its bitter dregs at Calvary. It was you who worked the pressure of love within his breast that caused him to suffer the separation of your spiritual death. You're not just one soul among millions for whom he died. Had there been no other human being on earth, the history of the cross would remain unchanged. And had the eternal record of mankind contained but one name, and that name yours, Jesus would still have left heaven to die in your stead. He knew you before the foundation of the world, and his eternal eyes saw only you from his blessed home in glory. And the preciousness of the one he saw drew him to Calvary to give himself for you. There's not another person in the world like you in his sight. You're unique, for he made you so. He not only created you, but he formed you as a potter shapes a vessel for himself. He made you as you are, that you might receive the personal revelation of his love for you, and that he might enjoy the privilege of loving you. All your beauty is in his eye, and your loveliness is in the heart of the blessed lover of your soul. Your eternal worth and preciousness can only be explained in the mystery of this great fact, God is love. But all your experience with love in this life has been with a performance type of love. All who ever said before you, I love you, demanded that you do something in return to earn that love. And so perhaps even now you're asking, what must I do to be saved? What am I expected to believe? What performance will God expect and demand of me in view of his love to me? Oh, dear listener, hear this good news. God only wants you to love him. This is the only response he wants of you and is the real evidence of saving faith. Difficult and confusing are the explanations theologians give when asked what it really means to believe to the saving of the soul. They prattle on about doctrine, dogmas, and creeds, as though saving faith were a matter of intellectual consent to some religious philosophy. The essence of real saving faith and the inner assurance of salvation is simply discovering that we have fallen in love with Jesus because he first loved us. 
true and real love as seen in the cross begets love in the heart of the one who believes. Love is the Holy Spirit's witness to the reality of true faith. You remember Peter once stood before a crowd and confessed his faith in the doctrine of Christ by declaring, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But the demons knew as much and trembled in the reality of their knowledge. And later this same man, under satanic pressure, denied with an oath the very Lord he had confessed. After the resurrection, Jesus met Peter at the shore of Galilee and asked him a deep, searching, personal question. Lovest thou me? He didn't ask Peter what he believed, but what he knew and felt in his heart towards Jesus himself. This was after Peter had been to Calvary and watched him die. This was after Peter had seen the wounds in his hands and side and had discovered that Jesus bore his sins in his own body on a tree. Now, after proving beyond question his love for Peter, he has every right to ask Peter what he feels in his heart for himself. Jesus longs only to hear him say, I love you. Now, Peter can't look at his performance for his answer, for it's been very bad. He can't look at his faithfulness for an answer, for he had failed the Lord. He can't look at others for assurance, for they'd been led away from Jesus by Peter himself. He can't look at the past, for it's filled with nakedness, fear, guilt, and an overwhelming evidence of inadequacy. He dare not look at tomorrow, for he had learned the weakness of his flesh and his inability to do what he knew was right. Peter can now only look at Jesus' hands and side, marked with the eternal evidences of his undying love for Peter as he was, and answer honestly out of the depths of his heart, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. This love was not something Peter did, but something he could not help doing. The boldness of Peter's answer must have shocked him. Naked, guilty, worthless, ashamed of the black record of his denial in the judgment hall, yet in spite of all he was and had discovered so recently about himself, he loved Jesus from the depth of his heart, and he couldn't deny it. Jesus knew Peter loved him. He wanted Peter to know that this was all he asked. God is not asking you if you understand the theology of the cross or if you can explain the details of Jesus' sacrificial death for you. He is asking you to look within your heart and answer honestly whether or not his love has begotten in you a love for himself. Never mind for now about your duties as a Christian. This is your first duty. And in loving him because he first loved you, all duties will find their proper performance. Now, all the words employed in the Bible that express what the sinner is to do in order to be saved are fully explained by one word, love. You can't believe in a person without loving him. You can't really trust yourself to another person unless you love him. You can't receive a person to your heart without loving him. Love is faith experienced in the heart and is the Holy Spirit's proof to you that you are a believer. Only the Holy Spirit can enable you to love Jesus. No man can call him Lord but by the Holy Ghost. When Paul wrote to the early Christians, he sent his greetings only to those who loved our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Not to all those who confessed the Christian creed or who attended the assembly or who had done Christian works and proven themselves faithful but he greeted those who were believers in fact and were known by this single mark. They loved Jesus Christ sincerely. Those who are the called of God according to his purpose are those who love God. To love the Lord with all our heart and soul and mind is the first and great commandment of the law. All the law and prophets hang on this one reality. Loving Jesus Christ is doing more than all the sacrifices and offerings of the law. It is greater than tongues, gifts, works, benevolence, or martyrdom. It is that which fulfills every law God ever gave and performs every duty He ever placed before men. When we learn that we do not have to perform to be loved, 
for the first time we find ourselves wanting to perform for the joy of him who loves us. Love is the only debt we owe him. And when faith, hope, and all other Christian graces are vanished, love will remain. The love of God bestowed on you in Jesus Christ finds its fulfillment in the response of your heart. He demands nothing, seeks nothing, but that you love him. Let me ask you now, do you love Jesus Christ? Not do you serve him faithfully, read your Bible or pray, witness, attend church, give, perform Christian works. I'm asking you this, do you love him? If you're a true believer, this is the one thing you can't deny. In spite of all you see and discover daily about your poor wretched heart, that one blessed reality remains. I trust you can sing from your heart the sweet words of that hymn. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. My rock and my fortress, my surety divine, my gracious redeemer, my savior art thou. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. Perhaps you're saying, well, I do love Jesus, but I, I don't love him as much as I should or not nearly as much as others. Hush, listen to me. When Peter answered our dear Lord's question, he could only honestly define his love as weak and less than self-sacrificial. John was the apostle of love, deep, fervent lover of Jesus, but Jesus didn't ask Peter to love him as much as John loved him. There aren't any degrees of love. He doesn't measure your love on a scale to determine its reality. Your love is unique because you are unique. No one can love Jesus with the love you have to give him. And Jesus is satisfied with the little or the much of your love. For it's called out of your heart by his preciousness. Each day of your life he'll become more precious to you than ever before as you learn more of how very much he has forgiven you. The woman who came to Jesus while he ate with Simon the Pharisee to break the alabaster box of precious ointment, anoint his feet, weep over him, and wipe his feet with her long hair, that is her glory. She did this because she loved him much. And Jesus said her great love was due to her deep sense of having been forgiven much. And the much that you have been forgiven will be unfolded a day at a time to your heart. As you discover more about yourself, you'll discover more of the dimensions of his love. And so the sense of your own love for him will deepen proportionately. Don't try to imitate another's love for Jesus. Your love is important to him, for no other can love him as you do. Now, if someone were to ask a father, which of your children do you love the most? He'd probably answer, well, I love each one differently for their they're different persons, and each one calls from my heart a unique kind of love. See, this love belongs to each child exclusively, and each expression of love from each child is unique and precious. And so with Jesus, dear listener, the little or the much of your love for him is the personal expression of your own unique heart, and it's precious to his. Hear him now as he asks only to see the travail of his soul at Calvary. Lovest thou me? And may each of you answer him in these words. I love thee, Lord, but with no love of mine, for I have none to give. I love thee, Lord, but all the love is thine, for by thy love I live. I am as nothing and rejoice to be, emptied and lost and swallowed up in thee.